I would like to introduce all of you to uh, Mr. Pinkesh Shah, who is uh, uh, ex-global vice president of product management with McAfee, and is also a director of programs at IPL, senior faculty, and an, an amazing mentor uh, who will facilitate this session with us with our today's speaker. Mr. Pinkesh, uh, welcome. And uh, I would hand it over to you to introduce uh, our today's speaker, uh, Mr. Akshay Rajwade. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sai. And a uh, very warm welcome to folks. Uh, I hope you guys can hear me OK there. OK, super. Well, uh, without further ado, uh, let me um, also introduce uh, you know, today's uh, speaker, Akshay. Uh, you know, Akshay Rajwade is uh, the uh, head of products, uh, head of growth, uh, head of a couple uh, different interesting initiatives that I think I'm going to talk about as well at uh, cure.fit. Uh, I think many of you know uh, probably cure.fit as, uh, as the umbrella, uh, you know, the super company that kind of hosts uh, cult.fit, eat.fit, mind.fit, uh, and, and essentially many ways to stay fit. Um, what's even more interesting is, uh, you know, while there are about 250 centers, uh, from what Akshay tells me, uh, in, in the country, uh, turns out that in the last six weeks, uh, there has been a tremendous amount of growth in the digital business. Uh, and, and I certainly look forward to uh, kind of spend some time and, and let Akshay talk more about it. Uh, you know, I, I also like the topic uh, that the Institute has chosen today. I think this has been close to my heart. Um, you know, as a practicing product manager for many years in the United States, uh, we hear this word a lot, you know, growth led product. Uh, you know, and, and now we're, we're hearing now is, you know, you know, instead of kind of, you know, growing uh, the product through multiple other functions of marketing and sales, uh, can we flip it around and make it product led growth, right? Uh, how can the product be, uh, you know, so exciting, uh, so sticky, uh, that it kind of sells itself, grows itself, right? And, and there are a lot of uh, interesting ways uh, and things that I think we're gonna explore and learn from Akshay because that's kind of in a, in a true sense, uh, a product leader uh, who manages cross-functional teams uh, at uh, Cure.fit. So, uh, so welcome, uh, welcome uh, Akshay. Uh, if you can, um, you know, say a quick hello. We 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 now know that your audio, uh, we see your video, uh, but we also check the audio is working or not. Thanks, Pinkesh. Uh, thanks, Sai. Hello, everyone. Um, you know, delighted to be here and talking to all of you from across the globe. Uh, thanks for having me, and hope uh, we'll have a good session today. Absolutely looking forward to uh, Akshay. Uh, Akshay, uh, before, uh, uh, you know, Cure.fit was also uh, playing several uh, leading product management roles. He was the SVP of products at Nearby, uh, you know, the Indian arm of Groupon. Uh, he was director of mobile products at Flipkart. Uh, he's an ex-Googler himself. Uh, but what's interesting uh, that you may not find uh, on his LinkedIn is he loves, um, you know, loves the trekking. Uh, is an avid traveler. Uh, so, so, so maybe, maybe we get before we get into the more serious conversation, uh, Akshay. What's what's been your uh, most exciting trekking? Uh, and uh, uh, I guess with with the last 40 days, I'm sure there's not much been uh, happening. I'm sure in terms of outdoors. Uh, but before that, uh, any exciting story you wanna gonna share of what uh, what has been your favorite moment? Yeah, I think as uh, you mentioned, right, I've been uh, very interested in uh, trekking and the most interesting trek that I remember was the one which I did in uh, um, Nubra Valley and Markha Valley in Ladakh in India. It was just a mesmerizing experience for me, an unforgettable one. And I would encourage everybody who is a nature lover, who is, uh, you know, has not been there to Ladakh, um, definitely go there and express, you know, experience the beauty of the Himalayas. It's, it's just uh, even inspiring. You know, the, the word is that with all the lockdown and, uh, you know, humans not polluting parts of the cities, in fact, cities are becoming a lot more beautiful and you may not want to go all the way there. There might be more interesting sites <laughs> nearby. Uh, so certainly look forward to that. So, so, you know, let's dive kind of right in into the topic. And, and, and this has been one of those, like I said, a very buzzword heavy, space, uh, not just for product managers, but also digital marketing folks, uh, you know, folks in, in uh, engineering and, and architecture, you know, and kind of how do you build products uh, and, and kind of in a way that kind of leads growth. And, 
you know, this word growth uh, is very interesting. Uh, Akshay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you some uh, pointed questions today. But before that, what I found, uh, a quick search on Glassdoor says that anybody who adds the word growth uh, in front of your title, your value goes up by 42%, right? So, uh, you know, a, a digital marketeer, you know, uh, who's kind of rebranding himself or herself as a, as a growth, um, you know, hacker, uh, is all of a sudden more valuable, and I think I'm the same. I'm seeing the same thing in PMs as well. Um, so, so my question uh, uh, to to you is: Can you kind of help demystify this word growth product manager? You know, how do you define that in your own uh, sense? Uh, I'm sure you're hiring people. Uh, you're obviously in that role. Uh, what does that mean? But before we hear from you, I also want to kind of start this off with a quick poll. Uh, you know, uh, from the audience uh, in terms of what do you think is the, the kind of most linked or related skill when you hear the word product-led growth? And uh, if you can get that poll uh, up for uh, you know, the audience, let's kind of see what, uh, what audience thinks uh, before, we, before we hear back uh, from Akshay. I think it'll be good insights for you, Akshay, as to kind of what the audience thinks as well. And, and then you can... Uh, uh, kind of straighten up the record, if you will, by uh, telling us the, the the ground reality. Looks like the audience is kind of split, you know, evenly across the three categories. Uh, you know, about 200 votes are in. Maybe maybe we can uh, you know pa pause and and kind of share that with the rest of the uh, you know audience as well. And I think for Akshay to see, but but I think the core of the question, Akshay, if you can help us kind of demystify these terms a little bit for us. Uh, it'll be a great start. Hi, Pinkesh. Can you all hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Akshay. Great. I think so. My screen shows the poll as growth hacking. I think it's it's a very interesting question, right? Because uh, one of the things which the audience itself, audience poll suggests that there is not much difference. I think uh, the first uh, preference is 41%, the next is 33, 26. So, you know, quite close. It's not 80% uh, versus 20% kind of split. And uh, personally, what I've seen is that I think it's, as you said, that it's a loaded word, uh, similar to, uh, you know, what UX has been um, in uh, many, many years now. And what I think about it is growth is something which is so fundamental to every product. It, growth is like oxygen, right? And the converse question is, if you're not doing what you're doing for the sake of driving growth, uh, then what are you doing? Um, and what are you trying to drive, right? Now, the question about growth product manager, that's a title, that's a role or a growth person. And it has definitely, a, you know, a variety of skill sets or a variety of domains, if I can call it. But very simply speaking, I would sort of bucket those into two, you know, core areas. One is essentially saying that, how do I inherently increase the value of my product or anything that I'm building so that it becomes more and more appealing to a large audience. So that's part one. And part two is how do I connect more and more people to my product? And if you look at it at a high level, pretty much all activity which is related to growth falls in one of these two buckets. Uh, if you are building features, if you are, you know, adding more use cases, which falls in the first bucket where you're saying, hey, my product was able to do A, B, and C, but now it is able to do either A, B, or C better, or it is able to do, you know, D, E, and F. And the second part, which is about, you know, marketing, distribution, partnerships, um, you know, funnel optimizations, conversions, all of those, essentially saying that how do I actually find the most effective path to connect the largest chunk of users to my product. And that's very broadly, you know, speaking, I summarize the, you know, the areas for growth. And of course, then we can go into the details and say whether you are doing the, you know, connecting the users part uh, through digital initiatives, which is like digital marketing, or are you doing it through social media marketing? Are you doing it through some kind of inherent capabilities that are built in? Uh, there are many ways and many different skill sets. Similarly, when you're looking at your you know, own product and you're saying, uh, hey, my product only works uh, with phones which have a certain uh, memory uh, requirement today. 
and below that it just becomes a very poor experience but then when you come back and you say hey our product team is working on features that will make it you know uh, work on low memory devices it essentially then opens up another growth access for you that now the marketers and the teams can go after those users who have maybe lower end phones with lower memory sizes and then can attract those so it's basically an act which you know happens in tandem or should should happen in tandem uh, that's very simply put and and so in your view akshay when we use this word growth and i, I really like the example right the one is how do you kind of connect to more and more users with the same product uh, second is how do you kind of improve and change the product to to make it more amenable to make it more accessible to achieve the goal that we just said which is connect to more and more product more more and more customers um, do, do you think growth um, uh, is more in the context of an inbound product manager where the product manager is kind of figuring out new ways new capabilities new features that allows for better growth or do you think growth uh, in the context of today's world is more around the customer acquisition side which is hey look take what you have but now figure out new ways novel ways uh, of bringing more customers which one is more important uh, in in your view and and what do people mean when they say that i'm a growth person so i think as you called out uh, you know quite uh, quite well i think there is a whole important uh, inbound thinking around particularly when you are looking at you know products i would say at different stages of your product life cycle if your product is at an early stage of your product life cycle which is i would say pre pmf or pre product market fit at that stage looking at the inbound thinking where essentially a product person or a product manager focuses a lot on how do i create value right that's the core question uh, and if there is no value created then nobody is going to use the product pretty clearly so it becomes far more important at that time uh, because you have pretty much no customers no users and if your product inherently does not have a lot of value then trying to use any kind of form of marketing to connect more and more people to your product is not going to work uh on the other hand as your product goes through a life cycle of maturity and it becomes quite mature as a product at that time then the balance possibly shifts a bit more which is post product market fit stage towards how do i actually now find better and better distribution channels for my product mm -hmm. and those distribution channels could be digital and online those could be through partnerships uh those could be through other means right but then that becomes more and more important because uh already the product uh has a pretty good word of mouth the product has pretty good uh, retention rates the product has pretty good you know user feedback or nps whichever way you measure so now you need to find ways to get it to more and more users uh so that's how i would sort of qualify i think when your second question was more about when somebody says i'm a growth person uh it's more common that they're referring to the latter part uh than the former part uh but i think both become equally important uh it's just that those are at, at different stages of your product evolution makes sense and so so essentially what you're saying is that you know inbound and outbound you know both are important from a product management perspective and and certainly growth can happen uh in both areas both zones it's just a matter of the life cycle and the stage with which you're in um and, and we'll talk a little bit about hence perhaps what skills are necessary in the second part of our conversation but before that can you can you walk us through maybe some uh, examples uh, some case studies uh, in your own environment obviously you work now both in inbound and outbound side of growth uh, you know uh, even some interesting things in in um, uh, cure fit that uh, that you are working on and i'm sure the the models are even getting more disrupted thanks to thanks to the pandemic um, where uh, you know everybody has to now scratch their head and figure out hey as a product manager what new ways uh, can i bring you know customers connect uh, that to my product in a in a adverse scenario in a different scenario than what the originally product was perhaps built uh, i think it will be very good to kind of share some uh, some success and failure stories if you can sure so as you mentioned uh, right around uh, you know if i were to look at how the evolution of technology products uh, has become right there are two two things which are kind of interesting uh, to observe one is the era when it was 90s when technology awareness was 
uh, not as much or you know the products which are coming out were pretty rudimentary and then you look at the 2000 to 2010 era where the capability of uh, technology was still evolving getting better and better uh, moore's law is a classic example right when google came out with you know google search one of the core problems google had to solve was how do i index billions and billions of web pages and then also keep those updated and it's a core technology problem where they came up with a lot of you know file storage systems uh, map reduce all of the bunch of applications and uh, at that point i would say that the core problem was on the supply side that how do i make i can envision i can do a bunch of things but how do i actually now make that happen from a supply side perspective because people were demand was coming up slowly now what we see is that there is technology and supply and uh, you know the moore's law has made it much more easier now all of our smartphones have more power than what some of the pcs would have had in in those days so computing power is increasing and it's also becoming you know i wouldn't say it's easy but it's also something that a lot of people can have that's why a lot of companies have also started offering these as you know services but what is also happening which is interesting and i think facebook's earnings came out um, yesterday or day before where they said that there are about 5 billion internet users and 3 billion uh, or 3 and 1/2 billion users already use facebook so the competition now is shifting at least in consumer products towards attention and the demand side right so how do i capture the demand side uh, because there is such wider choice and so much availability for the consumers on every side uh, that they look at and one of the things that we have seen also is another phenomenon which is the rise of the online and the offline or hybrid sort of companies if you look at the companies that emerged in the 2000s were primarily uh, i would say pure play from a software perspective google came in uh, yahoo started in 90s but then google grew linkedin grew uh, facebook grew those were the companies if you look at the 2010 to 2020 era the companies that came up were the likes of uber airbnb um, and similar companies right which have Uh, a both technology component for their uh, model but also a significant operational offline component and qfit is uh, a company which we are a health technology company uh, at the same time we have started from 2016 uh, to grow with a fairly large operational offline footprint so one of the things which we were looking at is not just you know how do we operate uh, gyms or fitness centers which we have more than 250 plus in india itself and the core problem statement that we are looking at is that you know uh, it's not just that we want to put one on a you know one more gym which looks like most of the other gyms but what's the innovation here from a consumer point of view and what's the innovation here from a business model uh, point of view i will leave the business model aside uh, for the sake of discussion but from a consumer perspective what was interesting is that uh, what we started looking at is the traditional model for fitness industry is basically relying on the fact that people towards the time of you know new years make resolutions and then buy memberships and then they uh, you know everybody sort of drops off or doesn't end up using it uh, much longer than a month right so as a fitness chain or a fitness company you basically uh, plan on selling a lot more uh, memberships than what your capacity is because you know that people don't show up and we started looking at it from a different perspective we said that you know ultimately fitness is a hyper local business if you are putting up a gym in one locality it's not that today you have that gym and tomorrow you are going to move it away you know 50 kilometers from where it is and this phenomenon where people sort of join or buy memberships and then don't turn up is going to be ultimately hurtful uh, to the business to the you know company so how do we keep people coming back to the gym and uh, you know work out with us and we did a bunch of sort of experiments learnings where how do we actually uh, think through why people drop off how do we motivate them and i can share some of those uh, you know learnings but primarily trying to get people back to the to the fitness centers and the idea which we saw from the data is that once people stop coming they stop renewing as well and once people keep coming they keep renewing as well so that's you know the key insight was when somebody says retention uh one of the observations that we had is retention retention is directly linked to the activities that people have when they come back to the gym 
and we did you know a bunch of experiments trying to run challenges uh, giving people uh, an opportunity uh, you know to participate compete with other people uh, small things such as we had a pause feature uh, which we uh, initially had modeled that you can pause and until you unpause it stays on pause uh, but we said hey let's not do that let's sort of ask the person when you're going to come back and that behavior actually forced you know some psychological effect on people saying if i'm saying that i'm going to return to uh, you know my fitness routine in another two weeks then i'm more likely to come back versus i just you know say hey i will return whenever i can you made a and, pledge yeah and essentially keeping yourself you know on that track and that really really worked for us because then we could get our you know user retention and user activity much higher compared to any other gym that was out there and people enjoying your product is the best proxy that they will be continuing to use that product and renew it uh, so that's how we sort of looked at it uh, that's one example of things that we looked at at kyofit and i'm sure that you know uh, there will be many more examples which uh, people in the audience would have uh, themselves experienced on mm -hmm. on this front and so so uh, you know talking about experiments i i kind of jotted down a few things that you were talking about right you know talking but but picking on that experiment um with the situation that we're in now and assuming that this doesn't get any better or assuming that you know uh, the psychological preferences of kind of going out and resuming the zumba the yoga the whatever class that was happening um how how is this going to change you mentioned something uh, early on about the online version of it and now a completely kind of different way of acquiring that customer uh a what's what's going on and more importantly how do you decide uh, what is it that you need to do and how do you react uh, as a growth pm what what goes in the mindset uh, of a growth pm in this type of situation uh, and and since you are actually doing it it will be good kind of to see a, a real real life case study sure so i'll just quickly talk about you know uh, growth from the perspective right like there are growth teams and growth pms i think personally what i've seen the best approach to it is essentially hypothesis driven uh you know experimentation and a lot of times there is a lot of focus on trying a variety of things but personally what i've seen um through the many years is that just trying things doesn't actually help and it's not really the pace at which you can do the experiments as much as the pace at which you can learn about your users and your market mm -hmm. so the hallmark in my view of a great growth team is the space at which they learn not the pace at which they do experiments because if you do not have a hypothesis you know behind an experiment that you're doing even if it works or it doesn't work right um you don't get better as a result of that experiment it is mm. essentially throwing a bunch of things towards the wall and see what sticks mm. and that actually is not a great strategy uh, a much better strategy is to think about how am i learning from what am i doing and one of the ways to look at it is every experiment that you do uh, for a growth perspective either should give you a uplift or should advance your learning and if your learning is not advancing at you know i i would say almost exponential pace at which you are doing the experiments then you're not doing something right because then you're purely relying on you know uh, ideas that come up in the moment and then you're essentially executing it but that's a game of luck uh, that's not essentially growth thinking Mm. the other thing as you mentioned right how does one think about on on this and i'll come to the digital part as well is that i think a lot of there is a lot of literature out there there is a lot of stuff that has been written uh, on how to drive growth uh, personally and this may be a bit of a different view than what most people would have been used to is that there is a lot of stuff that is being written but at the same time i'm not sure whether a lot of it is easily applicable to individual scenarios um because much of the stuff uh, that is written or that is shared uh, is from the past and the pace at which we are moving is quite phenomenal so the only sure shot thing that i have seen is essentially how well do you know your own product and your own customer and how deeply your understanding of their behavior is if you don't have a very deep understanding and again i'm coming from a consumer uh, point of view and i'll give an example of you know on the b2b side as well from a incentives alignment for a cloud business as well is that if you don't understand the behaviors and the incentives what makes people adopt or reject your product 
then anything that you do by you know just merely applying the techniques won't work, right? And as I mentioned in the cloud business, there are uh, a bunch of this is again from my previous experience that if you're a cloud business going and pitching to a CIO, and you're trying to pitch to a CIO to take their on-premise workloads to cloud, and you're pitching them on cost, right? Uh, you might want to check if that's the you know most important incentive for the CIO, because a lot of times, if you'll observe, CIOs don't get fired for high costs. CIOs get fired for breach of security and data loss and compromises on the customer trust, right? Yeah. So security becomes so much more important in the cloud business because you know that that's what matters to your stakeholders. Uh, similarly, if you look at you know another example in the consumer side, I would give is that people often you know confuse between uh, convenience and comfort, right? These two are very different things. Comfort is very physical, and convenience is very mental. And I'll give you a very simple example. In India, like look at the generation which is 50 years old or 60 years old and they paying their electricity bills right my dad who lives in mumbai uh, you know has all through his life actually gone stood in a line at uh, you know at a place and paid his electricity bill and even if i tell him that you know you can use paytm or some of the other apps that you can do it and uh, he wouldn't and if I were to ask him, of course, there are reasons like, you know, he gets to meet other people and all of that, is that he knows how to, you know, get the bill payment done in a certain specific way. It doesn't actually hurt his head in terms of how to get it done. But even if I have to ask him to use an app, while it may be very native to me and very easy for me, right, it's inconvenient for him. It's comfortable, but inconvenient. Mm -hmm. So if you look at, you know, desktop versus phones, it's much better to use a desktop to watch something. Right, because it's a bigger screen, you have a better resolution, you have, you know, retina display and all of that, right? You have more processing power, but most of the reading and content consumption happens because on the mobile phones, it's not more comfortable, it's just more convenient, right? And uh, that is where I think a lot of consumer psychology works. That how do I understand the behavior of somebody who is doing it in a certain way? What are the behaviors that are driving it uh, towards that? Now, coming to the earlier question that you mentioned about, you know, digital versus physical going to the gyms. At the core, what people want is that they want to be leading a healthy and a fit lifestyle. Uh, there are, and we keep saying this internally, right? And I keep talking to people that we don't have a demand problem, right? Nobody puts up their hand and says that, look, I don't want to be a healthy person. I want to be sick, right? Or I don't want to be fit. That's not the problem. The problem is, what I need to do to achieve that health or fitness. Mm -hmm. And that's where we come in. So now that we look at the digital platform, the question is how do we make it, you know, not just easy and accessible, but also fun and engaging for a lot of people. So one of the things that we have done on PureFit, what we call as, you know, PureFit Live or Cult Live now, is essentially offering live classes. And the experience of, you know, attending the class with thousands and thousands of other users. And we have a feature called energy meter, which basically tracks, uh, you know, how you're moving and gives you an energy score and gives you a comparison. And it basically makes it a much more social engaging experience. And the most popular format that we have essentially is dance fitness because people love, you know, not just moving their bodies and sweating it out, but also mm. having fun along the way. And it has taken off really, really well in the last six weeks. Although we had been working on this product for quite some time, but it's being at the right place at the right time. And everybody's sitting at home, they have time, they have desire. What they need is for us to provide a product or a platform where they can engage themselves, uh, you know, have fun and get fit. Uh, so that's, you know, what's been happening. And I see this trend, you know, uh, increasing much more going forward. A simple thing is like, you know, if there was no COVID, we would have all had this meeting in, uh, you know, some kind of a hotel. Absolutely. And we are sort of forced to be having this in a virtual scenario. Uh, going forward, I think everybody would, you know, give it a thought whether it really needs to be a physical space, given all the logistics involved, given the limits of participants involved and all of that. So that paradigm shift is going to be pretty real uh, pretty soon. So there is going to be a pre-COVID and a post-COVID world. Uh, no, very true. Go back. Very true. We've seen, uh, in fact, uh, in the last three days, we've seen people from 
uh, different parts of the country who would have otherwise not been able to participate in these festivals, which we've done, um, you know, annually every year. More importantly, people from outside, you know, Philippines, Singapore, we've had people from outside of the country uh, as well. And so this is a very different model uh, for this as well. But, but going back to, uh, you know, linking what you said, I really kind of struck me comfort versus convenience. In your view, this whole new model, and I'm glad to see that in the last six weeks, it's taken up well, uh, you know, with this whole online, you know, uh, 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 you know, kind of uh, dance based fitness or yoga. Uh, do, you, do you think it's going to be convenience driven or comfort driven? W what is going to be the driver in your belief with what you've seen so far in that last six weeks? So I think definitely it is going to be convenience driven. And it is also because you're basically spreading out, right? And it's also fun driven. So this is something that I was talking to a friend of mine who's using the product. And he shared this insight, which is from a consumer behavior. He said that if I go to a cult center and I'm participating in a dance fitness class, I have to dance the way the instructor is dancing. At my home, when dance is going on, I can dance with whole family and nobody's mm -hmm. watching. So I can just have fun. Right? <laughs> this is what I'm talking about understanding with people. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a family activity with a lot yeah. of fun around it. Right? And it's very easy for you to, you know, join, very easy for you to step back. And the whole social experience around it uh, mm. makes it feel that you are almost in a real place, uh, real physical, uh, physical space. And uh, that's what I think, that it's going to be convenience, it's going to be variety, and it's mm. going to be a lot of, uh, you know, fun and entertainment that's going to sort of keep driving it. Very interesting. Well, certainly good luck uh, with, uh, with, with that growth experiment that you're going through. And I'm sure... Uh, you know, people will kind of find uh, interesting new ways. Uh, and I like that, you know, be, beyond the 250 centers, now you can probably get people who would otherwise have not been uh, feasible for them to kind of get to one. Uh, you also mentioned a few times, uh, you know, consumer psychology, uh, the whole experiment design. I'm going to, you know, shift the question slightly to now defining uh, a typical skill set uh, you know, beyond just the mindset, a typical skill set for a for a growth, uh, you know, for a growth PM, right? You know, for for somebody who's kind of managing a product-led growth. Uh, but before we hear from you, can I get a poll uh, on the screen? Uh, you know, we've heard uh, these are the five things at the institute that we've heard now over the last uh, two years, especially uh, when we've uh, interviewed and we've worked with you know several uh, leaders around the world on how they've defined, in fact, OpenView uh, has written a whole uh, section. They, they've kind of popularized this whole world of uh, you know, product-led growth. And for the audience who've not uh, read that article, uh, I strongly encourage you guys to take a look at it. Uh, in some sense, uh, they've been pioneering this world and championing this world. Uh, but if you, if, you, if you look at this um, set of uh, five specific things that have been outlined by the, uh, uh, by the council, by the practitioners in terms of what skills are really crucial uh, beyond traditional product management? I mean, obviously, product management itself has many skills from you know, market analysis to, to strategic planning, to product planning, to go to market, to sales enablement, and so on and so forth. But, but beyond a traditional PM, as one aspires to kind of become um, or, or practice uh, a, a growth PM, you know, what skills uh, you know, do you think are necessary? So it'll be very interesting to see what the audience thinks uh, here uh, and then kind of get your take on it, Akshay, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, what you see and how, how, do, you, how do you look at this, um, you know, obviously, but as a practicing growth PM, uh, but also when you hire, you know, what kind of things are you going to be more weighing on, um, are going to be preferring more uh, in the candidate uh, when you, when you kind of look at this, uh, 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 you know, for hiring yourself at, uh, at, at, uh, 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 at your fit. So, um, so let's see what, uh, the, so the polls, uh, the, the, the results are in front of you and, uh, you know, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, you know, your hypothesis and experiment design certainly came up on the top. Uh, one of the bubbled up thing, user experience seems to be, you know, uh, very high. And I think you mentioned about that as well. Uh, and, and the rest is all in front of you. So what's your take on it? Uh, do you agree? Do you disagree? Uh, is there something else beyond the five uh, that are core skills that are mentioned here that you believe every PM, uh, every growth PM uh, needs to have beyond traditional uh, product management? Sure. So I think the two 
which I mentioned here, I agree with. I would just say the three most important things which I find uh, for a growth person, right, is essentially almost like being, uh, think that you're a part of a CIA or a KGB or a RAW or something, right? You should have a very acute sense of observation. Uh, primarily, you know, more than most people. Like, uh, you should be able to observe things as they are happening and question why. Uh, that, I think, ranks really high in my list of things because as a growth person, you are almost looking at, you know, what is happening. And if you don't grasp that, you're only... And that has both qualitative as well as quantitative aspect of it. Looking at people, looking at behaviors, that's one part of it. Also analyzing and understanding data, understanding, you know, what the data is trying to tell you uh, is the second part. Then beyond acute sense of, you know, observation is essentially being able to uh, synthesize and hypothesize as to the why of whatever that you're observing, right? One is essentially your observation and power of observation gives you that data point or that data platter on, uh, on which you can rest. And then really questioning why until you're not satisfied. Again, going, I would say, not two steps, but five steps ahead of a general person that, you know, if this happened, then why this? If this, why did not this happen? Having that skeptic mind and continuously question why is something happening or why is something not happening. And the third skill set, I would say, is being able to ideate on what could, you know, solve or address particular thing. So I would summarize into three things. One is essentially ability to observe things much better than others. Ability to ask questions why and get to the depth of it. And the third essential one is coming coming out of it and saying that the first two parts are analytical, the third part is synthetic, right? It is to say, okay, I'm going to be able to observe, um, you know, analyze and then craft uh, a response to something that is going to happen. Those would be the, you know, top, top three uh, skill sets that I would sort of look at from a growth PM perspective. Makes sense. Makes sense. And I think the first, uh, you know, the first two at least are kind of part of that empathy you know, that, that, that empathy mapping, that that whole, you know, design thinking principle. But I think the last one is interesting because now you have to kind of synthesize, as you said, you know, put forward a prototype uh, of how you're going to solve that. Now, you know, just getting the insights of what's wrong or what is the problem is not enough. You know, you need to have a version of a solution that's kind of acceptable uh, in, yeah. in many sense. And I think that's what makes the difference between a product person and an analyst. I think the first mm -hmm. two parts are more analytical mm -hmm. and being able to you know, switch gears from being analytical to being synthetic, because these are exactly opposite things, right? Absolutely. Uh, makes it a very, very good, you know, growth uh, sort of a person. That you can I think it's a, yeah, I think that's brilliant advice. You know, I, I hear a lot of people sometimes, um, uh, uh, you know, talk about business analysts and people who are in that role. Uh, and they're too often, you know, uh, project management, business analysts, they're, they're too often focused on kind of analyzing what the customer needs are. Uh, so much so that they sometimes forget to ask the why, as you, as you mentioned. Uh, but even more importantly, uh, now that you know what is expected, you know, how do you now create? And this goes, goes back to your creative skills, right? You know, uh, your ability to, to kind of synthesize and put forward a prototype, right? Very good. Uh, are there any, so Biplov, I'm going to switch to uh, some questions. I think we've got a, a very strong stream uh, of questions coming in, uh, Akshay. And so while I have a list, list of things, uh, I'm going to pause my list and kind of switch to them. Uh, so Biplov uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and Cheryl both have a, a similar question. Essentially, you know, when you do these experiments, um, are they more data driven? Are they more instinct driven? Uh, you know, give us a give us a view uh, because sometimes uh, you know data can say what you want it to say uh, or what you want it to be interpreted as, uh, and, and many a times uh, you know there is no replacement for instinct. Now, how do you draw that line, especially because it's an experiment and nobody really knows what to expect uh, out, out of a new experiment, uh, out of the hypothesis design? So, how how would you advise? Uh, you know, people who are in that uh, zone and how do you solve, how do you make those decisions? Yeah, I think it's a great question. Uh, I would say it's, it can be either, right? And it, I would say it should be either, right? Uh, it's not only data or not only instinct. It's basically data or instinct leading to a hypothesis. And that's what I look at. Uh, 
that if your hypothesis says that you know let's say let's say a very classic case right uh, if your experiment says that i have a product where i have launched a referral program and your hypothesis says that people are not inviting other people or referring other people because the reward that i'm giving for a referral is too low right now what is too low or what is low or what is high these are all subjective things right uh, 25 rupees can be good not good from some now how do you test that if that is the hypothesis and then you say okay fine this is the hypothesis that i believe uh, because i see something in the data or i do not see something in the data or i have done a few customer calls or talk to friends and this is what it is then you say okay let's go ahead and test it right then what do you think should be a reward which is not too low or which is high sufficiently high right and then you construct that reward then you say okay now if you are running an experiment then it should say that if i do this then what right and if you can write that statement that i think this is the phenomenon because of this in response to it if i do this increase your reward mm-hmm. i will expect to see you know 2x jump in the number of referrals that are happening 2x mm-hmm. is just a placeholder mm-hmm. but you need to put something which you expect it should not be it will increase the number of referrals of course it should increase uh, if the reward is higher it should not be lower now yeah. now you have a hypothesis statement right which clearly tells you what is the reason why you think about it this way how you have sort of come to it whether it's data or whether it's any kind of qualitative conversations you have designed something which you think is going to be responding to that situation and you have designed or articulated what an outcome should be which tells you whether you have succeeded or failed and if you succeed then you say okay fine uh, this is something which is pretty good and i think i would just take a you know moment to talk about mvps right because it is very closely related mm-hmm. uh, when te- people typically talk about minimum viable product uh, there are essentially two kinds of mvps uh, one is what you can call as a validating mvp and the other what you can call it as an invalidating mvp right now let's say what is an invalidating mvp let's say you're building a product which you are planning to sell to customers at some point in time uh, right and you build you know the best version of that product uh, that you can possibly can and you offer it to your customers for free right and still nobody takes it from you let's say that's experiment what it does this is an invalidating mvp which means that i put together everything that i could think about in this product i gave it for free and nobody is buying it mm-hmm. right so it has invalidated the proposition that this kind of a product will be desirable to customers however in this scenario if people took it from me it doesn't prove anything of course i put all the features in of course i gave it for free so everybody is going to take it on the other side the validating mvp it says that you literally built the most basic version of the product that you can think about and you see if people are adopting to it right if people adopt the product then it validates your concept that look this is such a bare bones version of the product and people have adopted it so it means that there is going to be demand because my next version of the product is going to be materially better in terms of some performance some features some use case something else so of course they will buy mm. however for a validating mvp kind of a prototype you say people are not buying it it doesn't tell you anything because hey come on it's the most basic version of the product right so similarly for growth experiments one has to think through that okay if this is the scenario and this is my response it should validate or invalidate something that i think is true or not true and then construct the experiments alongside because then that will give you that learning which i was referring to fair point you know uh, one question that i think has also come up uh, uh, from the audience here and uh, you know shirish uh, is asking that i think uh, 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 in some sense uh, a couple of them have asked and so i'm going to uh, rephrase uh, what they're asking but connect it back to your last point about prototyping and creating these validating versus invalidating do you think growth Uh, and product led growth as a as a product management model right as a modern uh, model and we we talk about ai driven products we talk about lean products right and you mentioned mvp you know product led growth is yet another framework or a 
popular model that people are kind of now uh, you know using uh, do, do you think that do you think that it works best when the cost of prototyping and the cost of experimenting is um, you know significantly uh, low or do you think that uh, uh, even though the cycle might be slightly longer a product led growth um, is also applicable to perhaps beyond consumer internet beyond you know digital products um, and and before you answer uh, uh, coincidentally we actually have a poll on this question so thanks uh, uh, sirish for asking this but can we put one of that polls back on the screen and and really ask the question uh, is product led growth uh, you know applicable in some sense uh, you know beyond just the digital products beyond uh, you know beyond just uh, you know consumer internet uh, and and so on and so forth uh, let's see what the audience thinks but i i, I certainly look forward to your uh, take on this uh, as well you know one of the other uh, famous things we always hear uh, is that when you hear the word product led growth you hear this you know classic stories about slack and and zoom right you know with now uh, you know with the covid situation kind of what's happening with them um, you know you hear about uh, you know dropbox you you hear about and and so uh, i'd also like to kind of see if you have any other examples because you are in a very interesting space you you're not just digital but you obviously your roots were in 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 physical especially with uh, uh, with curefit uh, and, and so uh, how do you how do you kind of bring that product led growth uh, you know perhaps uh, in in an fmcg right you know uh, is giving away a 2 rupee sachet uh, to acquire more and more customers uh, back in those days you may call it promotion but in today's world would you call that a growth hacking technique uh, would you call that a product led growth and and so uh, would very curious to see what you think so so here is where we are i think 70% of the people who have voted now almost 200 220 votes uh, we can uh, we can kind of share the results on the screen uh, so that everybody can see it we can end end the end the poll and uh, it turns out that the overwhelming set of people think it is domain agnostic right uh, uh, so that's kind of the, the sentiment on this uh, control group here So what do you think, uh, Akshay? I agree with uh, the overwhelming sentiment. I think it is domain agnostic uh, because at the end of the day, I think let's take a step back and see what are products, right? And I read this, you know, uh, pretty poignant explanation even on software, right? Uh, ultimately, software is taking subjective human needs and translating into objective, you know, solutions, mm. and the. bigger the impedance mismatch the worse the product is the closer the you know lesser the impedance uh, mismatch the better the product is because i want to not just do something but i want to feel something uh, and i think one of the things which i believe is that product is not a capability product is a purpose right it's not a functionality it's not what it does it what it helps you achieve right uh, vacuum cleaner uh, sort of you know cleans the house but it makes you feel that you're living in a clean house right uh, so what it gives you so suppose let's say that you know you are offering uh, babysitting services to somebody and you say hey i offer you know babysitting services or nannies uh, what you are offering is not babysitting from the perspective of making sure that the kids are you know safe and looked after you are offering an evening of free time to parents right so it's not what it it is doing what it is helping people achieve product mm-hmm. is not a capability it's a purpose and that purpose is across the domains right there are very famous examples of this one of those i'll quote a couple of those uh, one is essentially in the 1950s mm-hmm. where uh, in the us the cake mixes were being introduced and the cake mixes uh, somehow were not taking off uh, and if you looked at the details of it it was very easy to make a cake uh, just you know put the mixture and you know you didn't have to do much and the manufacturers and the brands thought that isn't it wonderful that you don't have to do anything but from the consumer perspective it was very different because mm-hmm. baking a cake was something an occasion when you are inviting somebody to your home and it showed not just the fact that you are serving them with food but the fact that you have 
put in an effort to welcome them to your home and made some contribution to make their visit a pleasant one. And a lot of women felt that they were almost cheating on their domestic duties by just having a cake mix, mixing it and then putting it in front of the guests. Yeah, where is, where is the display of effort and where is the, yeah, yeah absolutely. It made a yeah. small change, which was essentially, and of course there are two views on it, but they said that, you know, all that you needed to do was break eggs and put it into the cake mixture and then mix it and put it. Mm -hmm. And then it just flew off the shelf because then it gave you the feeling that, you know, you're doing something which is uh, leading to, uh, you know, a display of effort, a display of mm -hmm. care, a display of something. Another great example is if you look at IKEA stores and how those are designed, they have done very small things which are, so you enter an IKEA store and they give you a pencil and a paper to look at, you know, what are the things that you actually uh, sort of want to buy and you jot down things. It's for the simple reason that if as human beings, we have this tendency of, if we create a list, it gives us some psychological satisfaction of checking off all the items on that list. Mm -hmm. You don't like to keep a list and then make it. So if I can yeah. get you to make a list, I'll get you to check off the list, right? Uh, there is a reason why, you know, they start with smaller items at the beginning of their store because they don't want to start with a huge sofa set, which costs you a bomb and, you know, make you feel the other way. Um, if you look at, you know, in the US, there's uh, Costco and they have their famous, you know, uh, five dollar you know rotisserie chicken and they it's well known that it's a loss making product it tastes fantastic and everything it's right at the end of you know the Costco store sure and sure. the reason why it is placed there is because it makes you walk through all the aisles and sure you're not going to go to Costco find a parking do all the effort and then just buy stuff which is worth five dollars right you're sure going to yeah. pick up some so all I think, of I think growth product led yeah. growth you know store design uh, there are plenty more examples Good, good point. And I think retail industry has been kind of using this product placement uh, as a science for a long time. And, and I think your point is that, look, product-led growth is not just digital. It can actually happen with just about any business. Uh, I think what most people also said uh, on the poll, it is domain agnostic. Um, you know, uh, we're, we're almost out of time. Uh, our, our next speaker uh, is also here. Amit, uh, good to see you. Uh, you know, uh, Amit is uh, the, the chief digital officer uh, at GE and is logging in from uh, US right now to speak uh, to speak with us uh, and, and spend some time. But hey, truly, uh, you know, this is a fantastic uh, opportunity. I think uh, you've kind of dispelled a lot of myths, uh, Akshay, on uh, on how this works. Uh, one of the one of the interesting questions that came up and, and we ran out of time, but I, I encourage you if you can actually go to the thread. There's a dedicated thread where a lot of questions have been asked, you know, Satish, Srishendu, uh, Manoj's question was all about, you know, what is the true star, you know, true North Star metric for CureFit? Uh, I think I'll, I'll let you uh, maybe answer those questions on the thread. So the rest of the 24,000 followers on the Institute's LinkedIn page also get a chance to, uh, to kind of see your response um, and, and enjoy that. But uh, truly appreciate, uh, you know, uh, all the insights. Uh, back to you, Sai. I know we're kind of five minutes over uh, our original time and I can't wait to get started with Amit, but I'll let you uh, uh, summarize and, and wrap up here. Well, uh, thank you so much for uh, the very insightful conversation, um, Akshay. Uh, some of the things that I always wanted to understand, you took really some time to clarify that. Really appreciate it. But um, as Pinkesh said, there are several questions uh, on the thread, uh, I'm also more curious now about what is your North Star metrics for CureFit. But uh, if you want to tell me in private, uh, I'll keep it up uh, without that. And thanks for asking those questions. Um, uh, Akshay, thank you for your time. Really appreciate you uh, doing this.